Adolf Hitler had a need for speed. It was the key feature in his plans for Blitzkrieg, what we call Lightning War. So the Nazis poured resources into developing the fastest engines, sleekest race cars, and drivers who were the best of the best. We'll meet the Jewish driver who took on these would-be Aryan supermen next. The new German cars have streamlined bodies, and the prestige of Hitler's Germany is at stake. The revolutionary silver cars, weighing well under a ton, have engines producing nearly 300 horsepower, the first new racing cars of the Third Reich. Hello, history lovers, and welcome. I'm your host, Dean Carianis, and this is the History Author Show on iHeartRadio. Now number one in podcasting, thanks to loyal listeners like you. In this episode, we welcome a familiar face back into our time machine. It's Neil Baskin. We previously caught up with him in Norway when we talked about the Winter Fortress, the epic mission to sabotage Hitler's atomic bomb, and the escape artists, a band of daredevil pilots, and the greatest prison break of the Great War. You can enjoy those chats in our archives at historyauthor.com. And here we are, buckled up for Neil Bascom's latest book, Faster, How a Jewish Driver, an American Heiress, and a Legendary Car Beat Hitler's Best. In it, we meet three unlikely heroes who left the master race in second place. The scene is the Grand Prix in the 1930s, where we'll join the pit crew of Rene Dreyfus, a former top driver on the international circuit who had been banned from the best European teams because his mother was Jewish. We'll also meet Charles Wiefenbach, desperate to save his car company as the Great Depression ground on and Europe inched towards another world war. There's also Lucy Schell, the adventurous daughter of an American multimillionaire yearning to reclaim the glory of her rally driving days. Together, this trio humiliated Hitler, who tried to have their cars tracked down and destroyed so this victorious run could be erased from history. Well, the Fuhrer didn't count on Neil Bascom. Neil Bascom is a national award-winning and New York Times best-selling author of several nonfiction narratives including The Perfect Mile, which frequently ranks at the top of books on running, and Hunting Eichmann. Also, one more step about the first man with cerebral palsy to scale Kilimanjaro and finish the Kona Iron Man. For more on our guest, visit neilbascom.com, follow him at neilbascom on Twitter, or like facebook.com slash neilrbascom. That last name is spelled B-A-S-C-O-M-B. Okay, now that we've arrived back at the golden age of racing, let's join Rene Dreyfus' pit crew as he faces off against Hitler's fearsome silver arrows and dares to go faster. Most impressive of all is the road holding of the German cars and the way they seem to float over the concrete surface. All other cars appear obsolete as they bounce and bucket along. I'm joined on the line by Neil Bascom, author of Faster, How a Jewish Driver, an American Heiress, and a Legendary Car Beat Hitler's Best. Welcome back to the History Author Show, Neil. Thank you very much for having me. It's always fun. Well, your books are always fun, and I thank you for that. It's always a thrill to get one of your books and see your name on the cover and know that I'm going to get an exciting story, a fast-paced story. And what could be faster than faster? What could be faster than the story of a race car driver? And yet I open this book and I find you not racing at the Indianapolis 500 or on the streets of Monaco or anywhere like that at 145 miles an hour, 125 miles. I think at one point you say it's a it's a football field or 120 yards uh, every second that they're traveling. It's amazing. But you start your engine instead idling in a rented SUV rather than in a race car in that Delahaye 145 that you're on your way to see. Why that choice? Why start stuck in traffic in a cookie cutter SUV that you rented instead of in a race car? 
in the narrative histories I write, I typically will begin a book, you know, sort of in a thrilling moment of action, like with my book, Winter Fortress, you know, you have the skiers coming down to sabotage the atomic bomb plant, and you're sort of right there in the moment. And I thought with Faster, I thought it was very important to give readers a sense of what it was like to drive in this Delahaye race car, this Grand Prix car from the 1930s. And so in order to contrast that with what everything we know about driving, most of us, you know, the normal everyday drivers, is to put myself in a, in a sort of typical car rental coming out of LAX airport, driving up uh, the California coast to go visit this race car. And just this contrast between, you know, Google Maps I have, the, the windows are sealed, the car basically drives itself, there's no noise, you can barely hear the engine, I can call my wife. That contrast with like, once you're sitting in this Delahaye 145, it's open air, you can feel, literally feel the engine through your whole body, the whole car sort of reverberates. You just are in that race car. It's so visceral. You're so in the moment and just such a contrast with the sort of typical daily drive. And so I thought it, that was a neat way to give readers right into the story. Well, I went recently to get my car inspected at the DMV. And as I stood there, I looked at all the testing that they did of the car. You know, you check your emissions, you check your speed, you check all of these safety things that we have today in the car. These guys had none of that. It's a dangerous job. And so I wanted to jump ahead in the book and talk about Rene Dreyfus because all of us, and even if you get in a little fender bender, you're scared. You're worried that something's going to happen. You're worried the next time. You're a little gun shy. My dad is a young man. My dad is a young man who works for Ford. And he had a friend who built a race car from scratch and loved it and loved to race. Unfortunately, he rolled it, and although he was okay, he never got that edge back, he said. And so the car just sat in his garage. He was a mechanic and had a garage and a gas station attached, and it sat there, and he would tinker with it. But he said, I, I never got that edge back again. So I want to jump into that moment of the race, of Renee's career, rather, uh, in racing. And we can meet Lucy Shell that way, too, because she helps to motivate him out of one of these, maybe you'd call it a funk. But... How does a driver and how does this specific driver get over that fear, knowing that you're working out there without a net going as fast as is possible in the cars of the day and faster often, you know, in a prototype car? How does he get past that notion? Yeah, I mean, it's very, it's, it's fascinating, this period of pre-World War II racing, because it really is that moment where they're now going 200 miles an hour. So in the transition period of 10 years, just the lethalness of these cars rise astronomically. And so deaths are pervasive. It would not be abnormal for there to be one deadly crash every weekend through the course of the season. Rene Dreyfus, uh, none of these guys wore these crash helmets that we think of today. None of them had harnesses of any sort, no seatbelts of any sort. To stay in the cockpit, they braced their legs against the side, and they by no means had the cages that you see in formula cars today. So it was a very mortal sport. It still is today, but it was even more so back in the 1930s. And so death was integral to these people's lives and, and they sort of accepted it. But then Rene gets into, you know, a couple of pretty terrible crashes in the early thirties. And they really sort of jar him out of his, I guess the best way of saying it is jar him out of his zone. So that instead of being one with the car, you know, he's sort of worried about what's going to happen in the next turn. And everything about race car driving is trusting yourself and pushing the envelope in turns and elsewhere to get just that much more incremental speed. And so when he loses that, he loses his edge. He really falls from being one of the top Grand Prix racers by the mid 30s. And so it then comes to Lucy Shell in 1936, late 1936, early 1937, where she comes to him. And Rene was a down on his luck driver. He'd been banned from many of the top teams because of Jewish heritage. And so Lucy Shell knew he was a great driver if, he could, if she could get his edge back. And so the story of those two's collaboration in getting Rene to be at the top of his game again 
was one of the key thrusts and the key themes of the story overall. You mentioned about the speed, all these safety things. I'm thinking of fire retardant clothes, too. I assume what they were wearing was not one of these modern multi-layer deals that could protect you from burns either. Absolutely not. And actually, in one of the uh, in the ultimate race uh, in Faster in 1938, Poe, one of the greatest drivers in the world, Tazio, uh, in one of the practice trial runs, his car catches on fire. He literally has to leap out of his moving car. <laughs> his body is wrapped in flames, Gee. and he rolls on the ground. A college student comes over and covers him and pats out the flames with his jacket. Fires and crashes and all kinds of dastardly things would occur uh, during these races. Faster really reads like a novel. I mentioned to you before we started recording that if someone tore the cover off your book, which I know probably sounds painful to you, it sounds painful to me yeah, too. Don't but... do that. <laughs> and I didn't know you and trust you and know that you never gild the lily. I would say this story has to be fiction. I must be reading a novel because everything fits in so nicely into a novel narrative structure. And part of that is your writing that's exciting and fast-paced, and you know what to leave in, what to leave out. But the important thing is we have a reluctant hero. Everybody loves that. In Rene Dreyfus, we have a man who doesn't feel any more connected to his mother's Jewish heritage than to his father's Catholic heritage. He doesn't really think that that should have anything to do with racing. He's one of those people who is really focused on what he wants to do. He wants to race, and that's it. Nothing else matters to him, so why should it matter to other people? I mean, he still has a life. He still does things, but that's the key thing. If you can go faster than anyone else to use your title again, then you should be allowed to race. So here he comes. Here he's going into a sport that means so much to the Third Reich, that means so much to Hitler personally, and they don't want to let him do it because they consider him Jewish, even though he doesn't, that doesn't really factor into it. You said if he'd ever thought of it and bothered to, he would have thought of himself as an atheist. It just doesn't matter to him. And yet it becomes the defining characteristic that other people see when they look at him. How did you go about telling this story from that perspective to build this guy up? And what combination of discrimination does he face along the line, if we want to think of this as his origin story, to make him realize I am half Jewish on my mother's side and, you know, I am a hero to people and a role model. And that's just going to be part of what it means when I win. Well, I'll, I'll handle sort of the first part of that question, just in terms of the writing process or more to the point the research process to sort of tell the story in a, in a novelistic way, in a, in a way that, that readers don't get a dry history, but they get something that feels very much alive. As you say, like, I think it's fantastic that people think, hey, I'm reading a great novel. That said, as you noted, you know, everything in here is true. It's accurate. It's documented. And the only way to sort of do that is to collect just an enormous amount of source material. And the Dreyfus family was very open with me. And then probably the greatest resource over the course of writing this book, and, and the reason I was able to tell it in such a visceral way in the details of these races and what happened and what the weather was like and whether the wind was blowing or what the sound was like is the writing on motorsport in the 30s, in magazines primarily, but in some newspapers, was just absolutely brilliant. The writers who were covering motorsport were craftsmen of the, the highest order. They weren't just writing about this lap, uh, he did it in, in one minute and 28 seconds, and uh, this person was second, this person was third. No, I mean, the descriptions are, are, are lyrical and, and extensive, and you know, not only British magazines, but French, German, Italians, they just had this just absolute treasure of description that I was fortunately able to draw from. And so with those sources, it just, in some ways, I'm not going to say it was easy, but it made my life a lot easier. Now, to go to your second part of your question of just about the story of Rene, you know, I really tried to, in a sense, I didn't think about him as a reluctant hero when I first set out on researching this story. I thought he was very much, you know, what you get on the first blush of this story, the kind of Jewish hero who goes and fights Hitler in the Grand Prix. 
but he was a reluctant hero and he did not think of religion as part of who he was. And I tried to get at that with his family. You know, I kept asking again and again, like, how did he show himself or what did he think about religion and, and did it change? And over and over, they would say, you know, he was a race car driver. This was his life. Politics had nothing to do with it. Religion had nothing to do with it. He didn't think about it. He didn't want to think about it. This was his world. Racing was it. And it was only because of the rise of fascism in the 30s, which had poisoned in many ways the sport of Grand Prix racing of itself, where Rene was essentially booted off the Alfa Romeo Italian team because Mussolini's Italy uh, did not want a French Jew driving for an Italian red racing team. Similarly, at this point in time, Rene was considered one of the top drivers. He was very fast. He was very consistent. He was very good on cars. And a German, head of the German racing team, once said that, you know, Rene's so good, he could be on our team. We'll let Hitler decide who's Jewish, which essentially he was saying Hitler could say Rene is not Jewish and, and he can drive for us. But that was not the case. They would never allow an individual Jewish heritage, let alone someone whose name is Dreyfus, which was probably the most famous Jewish name in all of Europe uh, at that time. Uh, so he was banned um, from the best teams, from the fastest cars. And as I said earlier, you know, Lucy Shell was the one who really invited him back in the sport to race at the top level again. And over the course of their relationship, what happens is, is Rene understands, begins to understand that, okay, so I'm not, I don't consider myself a Jew. I don't consider myself a Catholic, but people do because of the virtue of my name. They consider me Jewish. And the Nazis are doing just abysmal, awful, daily barrages of things to Jewish people. And Lucy, in some, many ways, it kind of inspires him to understand that he can be a symbol of what it is to defeat the Germans. And at the point of the sort of climax of the story is one sort of uh, young teenager in England who was Jewish and escaped Germany, listening to this great race at, in Poe and the edge of the Pyrenees, start of the 1938 formula. You know, to him, Rene Dreyfus was, quote unquote, the divine adventure. And so that transition from reluctance to embrace his heritage to becoming kind of a symbol of someone who's Jewish beating the Hitler civil arrows is a very interesting uh, and kind of great dramatic arc of, of the story that I write. When he's a restaurateur in New York City after the war, he finds himself listed in a book of Jewish athletes. And he says, well, if there was a Catholic book, I could be in that, too. It's not something, as you said, his family told you that even registers. But he does have this name. He does have that background that in the twisted politics of the Third Reich. I mean, even if you had a great grandparent, I believe it was if it was still 116th, that was it. You were considered not fully German and not fully human even by their laws. And so he's forced, he, he has no choice in it. And I just found that so riveting, especially when you see him overcoming things like that crash in the 1931 Tunis Grand Prix that I invoked earlier, where you write that it accordioned his car. These are things that if you're going to overcome that in a story, and again, this is all real life, 100%, but if that was a movie that would be the moment he's laying there in bed, feeling a little sorry for himself, feeling gun shy. Maybe when he hears cars fire up, he'd he'd wince a little bit. And somebody has to come in and help him find that motivation. That that person is Lucy Shell, and I like that she's not just this American heiress as she's described on the cover, where she's there to write a check and she doesn't really do much. She's really involved in the story you tell in Faster. She served as a nurse in the Great War. So at this period before the carnage of the Second World War, she's very much aware of the blood spilled by a Germany on the march. You talk throughout about her. You really give us a sense of who she is. You mentioned talking to the Dreyfus family and all those great news stories, and I agree with you, those old sports news stories, they really knew how to write those guys, make you feel like you were there, make your pulse pound, and that's exactly what you do in Faster, as well as your two previous books we talked about that are right here on my shelf in front of me, actually. But those are all really great moments with her, 
And I wonder, since she wasn't somebody that was as in the public eye, sports pages weren't writing about her, maybe society pages, how did you go about uncovering her story so that you could flesh it out so completely? Well, I was one of my dedications with this book was to revive and place Lucy Shell into the history books because she's largely a forgotten figure. And she was is such a, a, a riveting individual. I mean, yes, she was very wealthy. Yes, she sort of was born with a silver spoon in her mouth, but she went on to become, you know, a top Monte Carlo rally driver, a very top one, uh, probably the top American rally driver in the 1930s. And then she was the first woman to own and run her own Grand Prix racing team, which is pretty remarkable. And so bringing her story to four was foremost of mind from my perspective. And so the difficulty was is that she, you know, her husband died right before the war. Her two sons perished, one in the 1960s, another in the, in the 1990s. But none of them gave any interviews. None of them had uh, any children, as far as I know. And so going to the family was impossible. And fortunately, a very good French-English historian named Anthony Blythe wrote a very good book about French sports cars in the 90s. And he interviewed Philip Schell, who was the son of Lucy, and he kept interviews, he kept papers and archives of, of the family and, and the Shells. And I went to Anthony Blake's son-in-law, and he opened up his English countryside home to me and gave me access to a lot of that, which is how and why I was able to sort of tell her story. And then I just went to her town, kind of hunted her story down, all the way going to her gravesite and seeing who her extended family was. So it was very much detective work, rooting out Lucy's story. And I guess finally, the best way is there was a lot of, you know, as I was saying earlier about the contemporaneous sources, there was a couple of French newspapers that devoted themselves to Grand Prix sport, and they interviewed her at length in a number of them. And in one, in fact, followed her in the Monte Carlo rally in 1932, literally where a journalist was in the car over the course of two weeks with her. And so all of that allowed me to sort of flesh out her story in a way that I'm very proud of. And I hope that people understand and appreciate Lucy Shell. This is something at the center of faster racing that's very important to the Third Reich. This is not just another story of, well, the German Superman gets shown up in some generic sport. Motors and cars and vehicles is key to Blitzkrieg. It's key to Hitler's prestige. He wants things to move faster. He knows that when the next war comes, he's not going to end up stuck in those trenches again, as he was in the Great War. It's a key part of his thinking, of his plan for European domination and world conquest, speed. And so... Here is a guy, a Jewish driver, Rene Dreyfus, and after France falls, they want to set about to find those cars. They know where things are, destroy them, and erase this story that you tell in Faster from the pages of history. How did the Delahaye factory and others go about preserving the physical pieces of the past, preserve those cars that at the beginning of Faster you were on your way to see, so that you were able to hold in your hands, so to speak, the physical history of this David and Goliath story? Well, I think the first part of your question, and I think it's important to highlight, motor racing and Grand Prix racing, and I don't think it's overstating it, was kind of a Trojan horse for the Third Reich to motorize and accelerate their army, which they knew eventually they would be going to war. I mean, the second speech that Hitler gave after rising to power was at the Berlin Auto Show where he stipulates very clearly that automobiles are going to be at the center of reviving the German economy. He's going to build the Autobahn. He's going to build a people's car so everyone could be in, in the car. And last but not least, he's going to rule the Grand Prix motorsport. He finances Mercedes-Benz. He finances Auto Union. Uh, just gives them a ton of money to compete at the very top level. And that says a few important things, as I was saying, of kind of Trojan horse. One, it's a huge propaganda win for the Third Reich, because the 30s were very much a time, thanks to Hitler and thanks to Mussolini, where Grand Prix became less about the individual drivers competing and who was the best driver. It became whose country is the, at the top. It became a nationalistic sport 
even much more so than the Olympics. And so when the Germans started dominating motorsport, that was a huge uh, win for Hitler. And you can be darn sure that Josef Goebbels made good use of the propaganda for that. The second key thing that the Grand Prix sport did because it was so popular, because the Germans were so successful, is it helped build up what was called the NSKK, which was a paramilitary arm of the German security state, which was essentially to recruit and train drivers for the future Blitzkrieg. And so you can draw a direct line from the success of Hitler's Grand Prix sport to the success of the NSKK and recruiting drivers to the speed and lethality of the Blitzkrieg uh, once war began. How do they mock those guys in the NSKK? What do they say that that acronym stands for? Uh, NSKK, drunkards, not fighters, <laughs> yeah. is what the acronym uh, was supposed to mean. But that was not very fair to them because they were very effective. Adolf Hunlein, who ran the NSKK and ran Germany's motorsport, was very successful in recruiting people and bringing essentially the Blitzkrieg to happen in, in such an effective way. Uh, in terms of Delahaye and the story of trying to erase the history of, of Rene's ultimate triumph over them and, and Delahaye's ultimate triumph, they knew very well that the Germans probably were going to try to find these cars. When the Germans first uh, came into Paris, they went to the Automobile Club de France and they stole all the records of all past wins and losses. They wanted to, to rule that history. Fortunately, the Delahaye uh, hid the cars, hid that there were four 145 race cars ever built. Uh, those were hidden, two sort of out in the open, and two were dissembled and hidden in caves and, and other places around the country. Fortunately, after the war, collectors, classic car collectors, put these cars back together. And they've eventually arrived here, actually, in the United States. Two collectors, uh, Sam Mann and Peter Mullen, own the four race car Delahaye's. They've kept very good records of their construction, of their racing history, of Rene's Dreyfus's part in all that. And so, again, fortunate to have all this material, thanks in part to these collectors who have kept this history alive and have put these cars back into the running shape that they used to be. And so that's why it was so, I think, important for me to get in the car and race it around the orange groves of California to get a sense of what that was like. You talked a little bit there about the German way that they would look at these drivers and about Hitler's focus on motorsport and about that being a way to get around the Treaty of Versailles as just as it used gliders. I interviewed Claire Mully about the book, The Women Who Flew for Hitler. And because they weren't allowed to have an Air Force, they would train people on gliders because there was no engine in them. So kind of the reverse, I guess you might say here of motorsport where, oh, it's it's a race car, you know, it's not in a tank. Then people might have gotten a little suspicious of, of what exactly the Germans <laughs> were doing. But this German opponent here in the book, Rudolf Rudi Caragiola, is a mere image of Rene in some ways in that he's apathetic about the Nazi party. He's not impressed with Hitler one way or the other when he meets him, but he finds in Hitler the only thing that really matters to him or would have mattered to Rene in that situation, and that's that he supports racing. He doesn't care at all why. He doesn't care about the politics of it. He doesn't care about the racism of the Third Reich. He just says, hey, here's a guy who's going to pour a lot of money into race cars and making me the best. Give us a taste of how you came to view the driver behind the swastika. Well, Rudy Caragiola was one of the top drivers ever in the Grand Prix. I mean, he was an absolute brilliant, calm, effective driver. He won, you know, the European Championship a number of times, even without the Hitler's silver race cars, which were the fastest on the scene. He still would have been the very top driver in the world. He had a very dramatic backstory that led to this, led to his joining the Mercedes team again. I mean, he was raised driving Mercedes. And then in the 30s, when, of course, the Depression and a lot of these car companies were abandoning auto racing because it was simply too expensive, Rudy started his own team. And he got into a terrible crash in an Alfa Romeo. He shattered his leg. The doctors had to shorten it. And he was in a tremendous amount of pain throughout the rest of his life because of that accident. Simultaneous with that, he lost his wife in a skiing accident while he was recovering. 
And so he had this one-two punch uh, and really was lost in 1933. Didn't really have a purpose in life, kind of gave up in many respects. What happened was that with the rise of Hitler and with the rise of the Third Reich, building these new race cars, they needed drivers and they needed the best drivers. In 1934, when Hitler poured money into German motorsport and gave rise to the Silvero race cars, they needed top drivers. And so they went to Rudy, asked him if he would drive again, if he could drive again. And racing was the only thing in his life at this point. And he would have done anything to do that. He did not care about politics at all, as, as you said. But I think the failure in Rudy is he was so obsessed with getting back into racing, and he did very successfully. He again became the top driver uh, in Europe with the Mercedes Silver Arrows. He was faster than ever and was at the top. He was the very best. But I think very, he very much lost his soul in the process of that because, of course, he was aware of the Nazi Party politics, their policies, their treatment of the Jews. And none of that mattered if he could race. I wouldn't say he was happy to, but he was more than willing to stand as a standard bearer for the Third Reich, to stand there in propaganda posters and in films and on radio, promoting the glory of the Third Reich, if that meant he could race. And he lost his soul, from my perspective, in that process. And it's kind of the tragedy of Rudy Caracciola, who I think in many ways has a a soiled history. You're enjoying my conversation with Neil Bascom about his book, Faster, How a Jewish Driver, an American Heiress, and a Legendary Car Beat Hitler's Best. You can visit him at neilbascom.com, follow him on Twitter at Neil Bascom, and like facebook.com slash Neil R. Bascom. That last name is spelled B-A-S-C-O-M-B. Mitchell Zuckoff, New York Times best-selling author of Lost in Shangri-La and 13 Hours, writes of the book, Faster is a full-throttle reminder of the power of heroes to inspire us in dark times. Neil Bascom has brought to life a gripping, expertly researched tale of an unlikely band of dreamers who risked everything to challenge evil. Neil, one of the things I love about history is indeed how it inspires us, as does Faster. In the grand scheme of the Second World War, it would have been easy for these three people in your book to maybe do what Rudy did in some fashion. Just keep your head down, not worry about sticking it up there to race in the Grand Prix. Say, this doesn't really matter much, it's only a race. Talk yourself out of racing again, especially after Rudy has that crash with Maserati. He could have just said, I'm done. I'm going to live a nice long life without the risk of dying in a crash. What do you hope that their efforts to resist injustice in their area of expertise inspires in your readers? Well, that's a great question. I think the key here, and I think Lucy Shell would say the same, is to take the fight within you, in your own arena. I mean, She was a race car driver. She was a rally driver. Her life was in motorsport. So she decided that what she could do to sort of take on what the Germans were doing was to take that fight within her arena, which was motorsport, which was to fund a race car, fund a race team to take on the Germans and defeat them and show that they were not invincible. And so I think for today's readers and, you know, young and, and old is not everyone can be, you know, the resistance leader at the top of the political scheme, but you can contribute within your own world and your own community in what you believe. And I think that's what Lucy did. I think that's what Renee did. And I think where people see injustice in their local communities and other ways, that's, that's what, what readers see. Theodore Roosevelt had a saying, do what you can with what you have, where you are. It would have been easy to overlook this. Instead, here he is on the cover of Faster, racing that silver arrow. In fact, I wanted to ask you about that cover art. I thought that that was really striking and different from your other two book covers that I have here. 
The Winter Fortress cover is a picture, and so here's this daunting building. Looks almost like it's a haunted house, and certainly there were potential horrors being researched in there. Here's a book that we have this Art Deco cover. Really cool. The race cars. It looks sort of like that AHA video, Take On Me. Those similar-looking cars. The, <laughs> the silver <laughs> arrow there with a the swastika on it that's lagging behind Renee's car, which is Blue, by the way, I'll let people pick up faster and hear why that's a significant color on the cover. How did that cover come to be? Why the change? Is that just a publisher decision or were you involved with that? Well, I thought, you know, when I spied my publisher and what I was fortunate enough to see over the course of researching this book was the tremendous art that was produced at this time, mostly Grand Prix posters. They were just absolutely gorgeous uh, representative works. And they had that Art Deco dramatic style to them. And I thought, what a great homage to that artwork is to have my cover be similar in in that respect. And so I have, in in fact, gotten a few people who've seen the early versions of the cover say, well, there never was a swastika on that silver arrow. (laughs) And I said, well, that's okay. You know, that's not exact. You know, it doesn't need to be exactly accurate. If you can see these, these Grand Prix posters in the 30s, they were not exact duplications of what these cars looked like. They were um, representations of their speed and their prowess. And that's what I hope readers get from the cover of Faster. It's fun. How did you come to this book? I mentioned your two previous books here in front of me, The Winter Fortress and The Escape Artist. So here you have a book on the Second World War and the Great War. I know this one takes place during the Great War, but it's different from those two books. How do you go about finding your ideas? The ideas come from lots of different places. Some come from larger histories that I read, and I see a a smaller story that I think could be told in a dramatic way that tells the larger story, but keeps readers super involved in a propulsive narrative. This story actually came to me through a friend who was a journalist and then pitched a story about these revived or restored Delahaye 145s that Peter Mullen and Sam Mann have really spent a ton of money on bringing back to life. And they're absolute gorgeous pieces of rolling sculpture. So there was a pitch from a PR person about, about, you know, doing a story about this. And my friend sent it to me and said, you know, I could do a little article on this, but this is a Bascom book. (laughs) And so I was very, very fortunate to have a good friend who was looking out for me. As soon as I heard the story of Renee and Lucy, I was in. I had to write it. And this is not a stock car. And the reason stock cars are called stock cars is because they're stock. They have they have specific allowances, they have specific design, and they can't be modified too much beyond that. You write about the challenge of designing a supercharged engine that could compete with those German silver arrows. You needed a car so fast that Rene could catch them. There's a period in his book where he gets sick from literally eating their dust at the Belgian Grand Prix. He goes home and he's coughing and he's burned. And you write that he washes his face in milk to try to get this burning sensation off of him. He's really suffering. So the Delahaye team here, I don't want to ignore the men that are under the hood. They have daunting technical challenges. You have to find a car company that's willing to pitch in with this Jewish driver, which at this point, this is what Rene is is reluctantly accepting, that that's how he's identified two people. And Lucy has to help him out there. She has deep pockets, you write, I believe, but nobody had pockets that deep to be able to just spend infinitely to try to catch these silver arrows. Discuss the daunting technical challenge that's faced here in catching those silver arrows. Yeah, again, this is another part of the story that drew me in so much. Again, you have Lucy Shell, who, by virtue of the fact that it's a male sport, is kind of on the outside. Uh, you have Rene Dreyfus, because of his Jewish heritage, is on the outside. And then you have this French automaker, Delahaye, which is really down on its luck, is known for mostly only producing sort of staid cars and uh, durable trucks and they are suddenly brought in to produce a grand prix race car from scratch in in many ways delahaye revived their company by making this gamble to participate in sports car and formula one racing and so they they succeeded um and it became a great success for them but the beginning and building these scar from scratch was, as I said, a huge gamble. It was very expensive. 
It's very complicated. You're talking about engines that are performing at the at the highest level. Mercedes and auto unions have spent years and have legions of engineers and workers who can contribute to the effort of building their civil Delahaye has a very small ragtag staff and to problem solve and to fine tune an engine that is capable of running at such speeds over such lengths of time it was really a, an incredible achievement. And it was fun to sort of follow these guys in, in the factory making this happen as well as the engineer who came up with the, with the car itself, uh, an individual named uh, Jean-Francois. That leads perfectly into my next question, which was about Jean-Francois. Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> They're a professional. Look at that. You didn't even know it, but, but perfect, because we're talking about the men under the hood, the men in the drafting room, and we're talking about Lucy, of course, trying to get those men to listen to her as a woman and as somebody beyond just, hey, write the check, lady, and, and leave us to our work. There's a great point in Faster where this driver and the engineer are at odds with each other because they both really know what they're doing. And Renee says, hey, I'm on this turn. I know what's happening out there. And the engineer takes offense to it and says, well, my, my car is right, basically. And why should I listen to you? You know how to drive, but I know how to build a car. Renee tells him, well, you get behind the wheel and you take that turn and you show me if you can make it. And I like that so much because reading a story, you want to have conflict. That's key to a story. And honestly, when I write, I find that hard. I want everyone to get along, but you have to pit people together (laughs) and get them fighting. And in this case, it's important because Dreyfus is behind the wheel and he's, he's the one whose life is online. He's the one who's going to win. And they call it a racing team, but you have to actually work together in a team. So, okay, Jean-Francois gets behind the wheel, he drives it, and he tests out and sees if what Rene is saying is right. So give us a flavor of that conflict at that moment and what grows out of it as these two are putting the 145 through its paces. Sure. I mean, there are different kinds of race car drivers. Uh, Rudy Caragiola, for instance, was famous for not really caring about the engines and how the cars run. He would show up at the track, uh, moments before the race in his sedan, he would get out, put on his you know goggles and, and cap and get in the car and take off and, and do really well. Um, there were others like Rene Dreyfus who were really fascinated and interested in the, the mechanical uh, and engineering of these race cars from their chassis to their engines down to their aerodynamics. And Rene had received over the course of his career a very good technical background from Maserati, Bugatti, Alfa Romeo. So he knew engines and he knew cars and he knew how hard to push them, what made them drive faster, what was occurring in corners to allow the, you know, the wheels to stay on the pavement. And so he was an expert in his own way, just as Jean-Francois was an expert engineer, a genius, knew the physics and knew the engineering behind how these cars worked. Rene knew them practically as well as all the education that he got. And so they both knew the business. And Jean-Francois at the beginning didn't really appreciate what Rene knew. And so he would say, take this corner at the speed, the car can handle it. And Rene would say, yes, it can handle it. Or I can actually go faster in it. And at other times he would say, no, it's not possible. And he couldn't necessarily even say why. He, he just knew by the feel of the car and the nature of it. And so there was this great conflict one day between these two, and Rene forced Jean-Francois to get in the car and try to take the turn at that certain speed, and he couldn't. And that began this sort of collaboration, I would say, of equals between Jean and, and Rene, and that helped them engineer a car using both of their expertise and really was instrumental in, in their ultimate success. I don't want to give away the details of the final race, but... I wanted to ask you to do what those great sports writers did and what you do so well and faster, and that's paint a picture for us. Bring us into the stands that day when we know that Rene Dreyfus is going to be facing off against Rudy Carogiola at the Grand Prix. We're there. We're looking at the cars. We have anticipation. What's the weather? What do we see and feel as spectators waiting for that first lap? And maybe if we're Jewish people, we're, we're really rooting for them. Or maybe if we just care about justice or we're one of the small countries that the Nazis are picking apart. 
What do we feel that day? What would the experience have been like? The experience of actually being there at the Poe 1938, which was the opening race of 1938 formula season, the new formula, massive crowds in this small French town in the Pyrenees. That's a gorgeous view of the mountains. It was a sunny day. It was kind of a perfect day for racing, not very much wind, crowds sort of herding around, uh, waiting for the checkered flag for them to go. And, you know, if you're there and you're watching these drivers as they pace about their cars, smoking cigarettes, and they're sort of looking uh, at their feet or talking or expending their nerves, and then they finally get in their cars and the engines uh, roar to life, then you're really overcome by not only the smell of the, the oil and the exhaust, but the sheer sound is explosive and ear splitting and you can think of nothing else than the, the power of these engines, and it's just absolutely overwhelming. And so you're there, and you know if you've ever been to a race, uh, you know a motorsport race, it is a very visceral, a very immediate, a very in the moment experience. You're not in the cars, but you feel you're almost there, and that made it such a delicious scene to write this start because there's so much expectation involved in this it was not just about renee and delahaye and rudy and mercedes it was really about france and germany and really about what the future of europe would be to maybe overstate it slightly and so all that emotion was wrapped up into this story well neil bascom author of faster that's the checkered flag for us Emotion is a great word to end on because there'll be so much emotion you'll feel when you're reading this book. It's just an exciting story is the bottom line. So when I say it reads like a novel, that's a high compliment from me. I love that. There's no reason why history has to be boring. I guess it should go without saying, but it doesn't always. This is a true story here. I was so happy that you brought me into the winner's circle at this forgotten race. I wish you the best of luck with the book. I think your friend was exactly right, and I hope that when people see this is a Bascom book, they want to go out and pick up the other books. I'm glad that you also remind us at the end of the book to slow down a little bit and spend time with our family, not always be racing. So it was really a great book. You start us in traffic, but you end the book with this great heart-pounding race of us going faster than the Third Reich. I thank you again for joining me, and I can't wait for your next book. Anytime it's a Bascom book, I know I'm going to love it. Now, Dean, you're very generous. Thank you very much. Well, it was. It was my pleasure. I really did love the book. <laughs> okay. I love, I, by the way, you give such oh. a great interview. It's wow. So thank fun. you so much. Just want to say, uh, one of the best, oh. really. Thanks. That's so nice of you. I don't, I'm not overstating it. <laughs> <laughs> no, I appreciate it. Believe me. Feel free to tell your friends. <laughs> I will. Again, the book is Faster, How a Jewish Driver, an American Heiress, and a Legendary Car Beat Hitler's Best. As always, you can find the Amazon link to purchase your copy at the HistoryAuthor.com page for this episode. By buying the book through us, you help keep the flux capacitor on our 145 time machine humming like usual. Thanks to Neil Bascom for joining us and for sharing a tale of that Hitler that old asparagus sucker sought to erase from the history books. Racing is just so exciting. I said so many times this book was like a novel that I had to consciously stop myself in the second half of the interview because I didn't want people to think it was fiction if they just picked up in the middle of the story somehow. It really is a great nonfiction book, and it really is a great narrative. You'll just love it, so forgive me for really pushing it hard. I just want people to enjoy great books, is that so wrong? If you enjoyed our chat, check out our conversations about Neil's previous books. Those are The Winter Fortress and The Escape Artists. You can also visit neilbascom.com, follow at Neil Bascom on Twitter, or like facebook.com slash Neil R. Bascom. That last name is spelled B-A-S-C-O-M-B. And while you're online, let us know what you think of the book and the interview on Twitter at History Dean, on Instagram at The History Author Show, or Facebook.com slash History Author. 
that's it for this high-speed installment of the History Author Show. I hope you'll join us for our next all-new interview right here on iHeartRadio. And remember, if you subscribe to us on iTunes, please take a minute to leave us a review. Well, until our next trip into the past together, thanks so much for time traveling with us today, and have a great week. We still call it Broadway, but what's in a name? Take it from Georgie, it isn't the same. On the east side, west side, things ain't like before. There are tears in the eyes of the regular guys. Oh, New York ain't New York anymore.